Okay, so what we've learned is that we can write now uh, partial u, partial x, partial u, partial y. We could write that as inverse Jacobian multiplied by partial u, partial psi, partial u, partial eta. So that's what we have there. And similarly, I could write then partial v, partial x, partial u, partial y as uh, inverse Jacobian multiplied by partial u, partial psi, partial u, ah, uh, u, partial v. Let's just wipe it off. Let's Oops, it is. Partial v, partial psi, partial v, partial eta. So that's what we have here. Beautiful. Okay. Um, and so these terms are the terms that make up the strain. And what we typically know is that we would like to write the strain as strain vector as BQ. Okay. That's that's what we have got here. In this case, this B must be some kind of a matrix. So let's think about this. This strain is a three by one. So the strain and its components are just ux, vy, and uy plus vx. Okay, that's what we have there. That's all still legit on the board. It's equal to some b matrix and some q vector. Okay, so it's important that we now think clearly about what this q vector means. This Q vector must be, if I multiply it with this B, I must be able to uh, relate to the v, U field and the V field, the U field and the V field. So this Q is sort of a combination of the, dis the unknowns or the displacements that we're trying to solve for in the X and in the Y. So let's just go through this. So if I have my element here, and let's go through this element that we had here with the numbering of 1, 2, let's write it again, this is a reminder, 1, 2, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So that's just the nodal numbering, okay? So if you understand how that nodal numbering works. But I'm gonna have now essentially here, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna call this Q1, and this I'm gonna call Q2. And this is just a convention. Q3, Q4, Q5, Q6, so I'm not going to distinguish now with Q U one and a Q V one. I'm just going to do this as a convention now, um, and say Q uh, seven, Q eight. What am I? Why I start there? Let me just wipe this off. I started down here as one, but it is no two. My apologies. Let me just redo this. Okay. <laughs> Lacquer on the slope. Okay, so a little bit. And one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Let's just put the colleagues there. So this is going to be here yeah, a lot better if we just do it like this. So this is essentially Q1. I'm going to say this is Q2. So Q3. Q4. And so take note, I'm doing it slightly differently to what we've done before. We said QU1 and QV1. I'm rather going to say, let's just put it in one long vector, okay? Um, as opposed to two separate vectors. This is now Q5, Q6, okay? And you can see that there's a pattern there. Uh, you, we can see essentially, if I take the note number, um, so all the, dis all the, all the, X displacement unknowns are odd. All the vertical displacements are even. 2, Q4, Q2, Q4, and Q6. And the vertical horizontal displacement is Q1, Q3, and Q5. So this will be, already you can know what this is, this will be Q7. Yeah? Q7. And this will be Q8. 
and so typically we can relate and say that the um, uh, I'm going to use now some some more formal language of saying each of these Q3 and the Q4 is what's called a degree of freedom. Okay, so this node has got two degrees of freedom associated, but this element as a total is essentially the number of degrees of freedom per node times the number of nodes. So the total degrees of freedom of this element is two, two plus two is four plus two is six, eight, ten. 12, 14, 16, okay? Because it's eight noted element, and there's two degrees of freedom per element. So the element, I'm going to just write the element, degree of freedom, that's EDOF, okay? Stands for element degree of freedom, is essentially 16, okay? The number of nodes of the element, and an E stands for number of nodes of the element, just to keep examples out of space here, is eight. And the degrees of freedom per node is two, because it's a 2D problem. Okay, so that's really what we have here. And if I multiply these two numbers, I get to the element degrees of freedom. But what I want to look at now is what is the degree of freedom number in terms of the numbering? So the numbering of the degrees of freedom. And this is just a, sort of a classical finite element. This is a choice. This is uh, arbitrary, but it's uh, fairly consistent. It's a fairly consistent choice to be made. And that is, if I want to know what is an X degree of freedom, I take the nodal, the, the node number. So these one, two, three, four, we call the node numbers. So I can say node. So if I want to know the X degrees of freedom, let's call it the X degrees of freedom. And that's what I mean. It's, this, it's in the, related to the U displacement. Let's call it, let's rather, instead of X, let's call it then U degree of freedom, rather. The U degrees of freedom, that's with the U dis displacement, and the V degrees of freedom, with the vertical displacements. So this will just be essentially, you can see here, it will be take the node number times 2 minus 1. 2 times the node number minus 1. So if my node number is 1, times 2, it's 2, minus 1 is 1. My node number is 2, times 2 is 4, minus 1 is Three. That's Q3. Note number is 3 times 2 is 6. Minus 1 is 5. Q5. And then the vertical de 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 degrees of freedom, what would that note number be? Well, if, if degree of freedom, it would just be 2 times the note number. So to get to the, if I have my note number 1, it's associated with Q2. So that's 2 times the node number is just 2 times 1. And so this is just a system, and the code that we're going to be working with you follows this numbering scheme. But almost any finite element package that you'll find will follow this local numbering scheme for an element. Okay, so this is just to make sure that you understand. So this is the element local numbering scheme uh, in that psi eta world that we typically would have. And this is just to make sure that we understand what's going on here. Okay. But that said, we have now this under control. We understand the fact that this is now a uh, single vector Q, what that single vector Q means. So this Q is, as a matter of fact, a 16 by 1 uh, vector. Okay, so that is a given. That's 16 by 1. This is a 3 by 1 vector. Okay, so I can guarantee you now already to say, we know what this is B is. This B is some 3 by 16 thing. Okay, so 3 by 16 matrix. That's what that must be. So I'm going to put a double bar for a matrix, single for the vectors, just to highlight that again. Okay, so that is essentially what we have there. And now we, just from really understanding what's going on, we can now figure out and say, this is sort of part of our understanding of what's happening with an element. And if I want to put all my vertical and horizontal and vertical degrees of freedom in a single vector, I can choose some strategy like I've decided here, and this is my numbering, my the strategy that I'm deciding on to say take the node number times 2 minus 1, that's always then horizontal degrees of freedom, so that's all the odd ones, and vertical will always be the even ones, that's just 2 times the node. Uh, and then I have a consistent scheme, beautiful. I understand, I can immediately tell you if, if I have a two-dimensional element, it's got uh, 14 degrees of freedom, not uh, 14 nodes. Uh, I, I know immediately it will have 28 degrees of freedom for the element. Okay, because it's two degrees of freedom per node times the number of nodes is the element degrees of freedom. And that's important that we're comfortable with that because that means it doesn't matter what element you're looking at, you know exactly what to expect, how many, degree, how many uh, degrees of freedom that element would have, and all that the degrees of freedom relate to is the number of unknowns that we're solving for. So in the end, for this single element of eight nodes, this element degrees of freedom really just tells us how many unknowns do we have to solve for for this element. 
in isolation and obviously it will assemble into the system and some of the nodes will be shared between elements and at the global scale when i look at that in uh, that the vector that i need to solve for that uh, displacement vector that is essentially the global degrees of freedom then that we need to solve for and this is essentially what 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 it boils down to so this is sort of classical finite element terminology element degree of freedom number of nodes per element no degrees of freedom per node um, but I just want to make sure you understand what it means. The element degrees of freedom in the end relates back to the unknowns of that element that we have to solve for. And some of these element degrees of freedom relate to the displacement in the x direction, and some of the um, some of the nodes, uh, some of the values in this element degree of freedom relate to the displacement in the vertical direction that we want to solve for. Okay, so this hopefully gives you a good idea of what the strain is. We don't know how this B matrix looks. We understand what this Q vector is and what it means, but we know it's sort of a three by sixteen matrix monster. And this uh, strain, we know exactly what it means and what it is. And when we page through the uh, book later on, we can then think critically about this um, B and reflect back on what we said here because we're going to look specifically at the Q8 element later on in the textbook.